Okay. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Please uh, make sure that you're muted unless you're speaking. Welcome to the sixth free Zoom program this year presented by Sons and Daughters of Holocaust Survivors of Greater Philadelphia. We are among the first second generation groups in the United States, founded in 1979. We are an active, vibrant, and welcoming organization. We know where hatred leads. If you're interested in joining, please drop me a note or drop a note to Jeanette, who's on the call. Today's program is our sixth in an ongoing series of Sunday Zoom programs at 2 p.m. Eastern time on Sundays. And we have two more scheduled before the end of the year. Please mark your calendars. Two weeks from today at 2 p.m. Sunday, October 29th, Judy Rakowski and from Florida, her 99-year-old cousin, survivor Sam Ron, will discuss her newly published book, Jews in the Garden, a Holocaust survivor, the fate of his family, and the secret history of Poland in World War II. This book has been getting rave reviews in the New York Times and elsewhere, and is attracting worldwide attention for exposing Polish government efforts to distort the Holocaust. That's two weeks from today at 2 p.m. Sunday, December, sorry, Sunday, October 29th. And then please make a note of this as well, especially since I see this author is with us today. It's 2 p.m. Sunday, December 3rd, Christopher Simpson, author, of the 1988 masterpiece of investigative journalism, Blowback, the first full account of America's recruitment of Nazis and its disastrous effect on our domestic and foreign policy, will make a rare public appearance sharing exclusively with us his latest research into the subject he has titled White Christian Nationalism and the Crisis in American Political and Cultural Life. That's 2 p.m. Sunday, December 3rd, with Christopher Simpson. Please make plans to attend both of these important upcoming Zoom programs. The link will be the same as the one you are using to attend today. Thank you. My friends, in our parents' generation, Hitler promised to eradicate the Jews. And in our day, Hamas has promised the same. Right. When our enemies rise to power, and when they say it, we must believe them. This is a lesson of the Holocaust. In Delaware, for almost a half century, 
Hannah Spirsky and Jaffe has been teaching the lessons of the Holocaust. As a girl, she hid from the Nazis in the forests of Belarus for 20 months, 1942 to 1944. And soon after she and her late husband and children arrived in Delaware in 1975, she became a tireless advocate for Holocaust education, inspiring countless young people with a message of respect and tolerance. She has spoken more than 400 times in schools, churches, and universities. She was inducted into the Delaware Women's Hall of Fame in 2021. Now 92, she's with us today from her home near Wilmington, along with her daughter, Linda, who has been a judicial assistant at the United States Third Circuit Court of Appeals and was instrumental in helping her mother with the publication last year of her powerful memoir, The Burden and Blessing of Memory. The killing of babies, the taking of hostages, the indiscriminate murder. These are themes from last weekend. The same themes from Ann Jaffe's memory. This program will last about an hour during which you'll have an opportunity to ask questions and it is being recorded. And I'm honored now to present Aunt Jaffe and her daughter, Linda. Thank you, David. I am not absolutely sure what do you want me to speak about, whether my book or my experience or, or, or my oh. feelings in general as to what is happening today. All of it. All of it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's start with the book. Uh, I, I was getting old, I still am, <laughs> and I felt <laughs> that a generation who has experienced the Holocaust must record it for future generations, and we must learn the lessons uh, from it as to not to ignore threats from others that they will throw us into the sea or whether they will kill the last one of us. We must be prepared and not caught off guard the way we did during World War II. And this is why I was hoping I wrote it in very simple language, mostly factual, uh, so yeah. that the younger people in schools could possibly pick up and learn from it and make it as one of their uh, curriculum, especially in Delaware, since we're now obligated to teach the Holocaust. But I was pleasantly, I was, I was pleasantly surprised how well it was received. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Sister Jean, can you kindly yes. mute, please? I'm sorry, Thank I you. couldn't find it. That's okay. <laughs> I tried to find it earlier. Oh. Hey, Mom, go ahead. Okay, I didn't know what I was done. Um, yes, so we must do everything we can to document and to advertise what happened at that time because God forbid it could happen again. Like David said, did you hear what a, 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 
is it Al Qaeda? Well, who are they? Um, Hamas. Hamas. But Hamas has said that this is nothing yet. They will make sure that they will annihilate all the Jews in the land of Israel. We must be prepared for it. And Jews all over the world, with influencing others, must learn from it and prepare ourselves. If we ignore this kind of threats, who knows what will follow next? So we must try to influence, first of all, our own people, and make sure that they do everything they can, and also to influence the American government to stand by Israel, if at all possible. It breaks my heart when I see the pictures that, that Hamas has shown on television, little babies killed in front of their parents and grandparents. It reminds me something that I saw. If you read the book, you have read the incident when a a mother was begging the German soldier not to kill her son because he was a baby and innocent. How cruelly, how cruelly he killed the baby and threw it into the pit. These kind of things, God forbid, if we are not alert, if we are not um, vigilant, might and could happen again. So you, the younger generation, you younger generation, try to learn all you can about what happened in the past so that you will know how to defend our future. We are very lucky. We live here in this wonderful country, the United States, and we have some influence over our elected officials. But what about others that don't have the same uh, power? How will they react to it? We don't know yet. We're just waiting to see what the outcome is going to be, and hopefully a good one with, uh, without too much blood. That's, that's the most important thing. I want to mention one little thing, and that is, David, I am sure, knows my dear friend. Dorothy Finger would have been such a great advocate and concern about what's going on in the world and especially in Israel. I'm willing to answer any questions that you have concerning uh, the stories in my book and uh, any other question I put to the television, to the Jewish channel. I hope you all know that there is a Jewish broadcasting service that is constantly uh, giving us news from Israel. and. Uh, I can answer. I will be glad to. If not, then we will have to learn together. Maybe well, I'll say thank it. you. Maybe. Um, I, I I just want to say that uh, uh, Anne uh, Jaffe is referring to her dear friend uh, Dorothy Finger, who uh, who's no longer with us, but who also published a memoir, um, and. Uh, they uh, became uh, very close friends after they realized that both of them had survived in the forests. And uh, as it happens, uh, Dorothy was uh, uh, a very close friend of my mother's as well. Um, so next year, early next year, we hope to do a program uh, about Dorothy's memoir, even though she's no longer with us, we will, we hope to have uh, one or two of her children uh, participate. Um, I, I uh, want to give Linda a chance before we uh, entertain questions. 
want to give Linda a chance to talk about about uh, your book and how it came about and uh, and uh, and all that uh, that went in that went into making that project come to fruition. Okay, well, um, I'm I'm Anne's middle child. Her oldest is Rebecca Jaffe, who's listening in, and youngest David Jaffe. And um, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, chaperone my mother to Mississippi three times to speak to people there. And also, aside from that, I've, I've heard her speak locally as well. And a common question would always be, have you written your book? And, um, you know, I, I knew that it would be a daunting task for my mother. She did not even reveal to me as her own daughter for a long, long time that any of this happened to her. And I recall having a, um, a school assignment. I, I'm guessing I was around 10 years old, maybe a little younger, where we had to interview our parents. And one of the questions was, what is your nationality? And my mother answered, Jewish. And I said to her, that's not your nationality, that's your religion. And she said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm Jewish. And I said, well, where were you born? And she said, in Poland. And I said, well, then you're Polish. And she said, oh, no, oh, no, we're not Polish. The Polish people hated us. And this was the first time I even had an inkling that something had happened in my mother's history. I knew she had an accent, um, but I didn't know anything. She had shielded me, and I'm guessing my siblings as well, from the horrors that they um, encountered. And I made her bring me her passport so that I could see what country she was born in. And she went on to say, look, it doesn't matter that I was born in Poland. I don't consider myself Polish, I'm Jewish such a strong identity. And as David said, once my family moved from New Jersey to Wilmington, uh, did my mother little by little start speaking and you know the rest is history. I mean, over 400 presentations, some small, most very large. And um, so I tried to encourage her to get this story down. As you might imagine, it was very, very difficult because these are not happy times to recall. And I did what I could to encourage her, but no matter what I did, it wasn't right. And so I just said to her, you know what, mom? You have to take a pen to paper and write it yourself. And so then for a year, I cheered her on every time. What did you write? Give it to me, I'll transcribe it. Until we had a critical mass of, um, of text and uh, we tried to put it in a flowing manner. J.D. Schwears helped us put it together and we self-published it. And uh, if you thought it was worth reading, here's a plug to pass it on to other people because our real hope is that it will be used as a teaching tool because it's a memoir. It is exactly how my mother remembers it. I wanted her to draw out the story and she said, absolutely not. I only want it to be what I remember clearly. And so it's about as true a story as you can get. And uh, we are very gratified that a lot of people wanted to read it and learn something from it. And my mother, what was really, um, what made my mother such a, in my opinion, such a successful speaker to young people and old, was that she had a three-pronged approach. Um, she would talk about European history at the time of World War II to give people, some people don't even know, believe it or not, especially young people have no idea what happened in Europe in the uh, late 30s and early 40s. So she talks about that and the movement of land ownership then she speaks primarily about her own personal experience, of which she is an expert, of course. And finally, she wraps it up by saying, what can we learn from this? 
there has to be a positive takeaway. And that is that we need to value life. We need to be kind to everybody based on how they behave, not to discriminate about somebody's religion, the color of their skin, their gender, and so on and so forth. So this became a very important lesson that can be applied to almost anything. And many young people came to her and said, wow, wow, if you could overcome your hatred after everything that happened to you, I feel like my future is also good. And so thousands upon thousands of letters from school children came flowing into our home telling our mother how much it meant to them that she took the time to come and to speak to them and that it has changed their outlook on life. And some people have said the same thing about the book. It's simple, but direct. And we hope that some schools might pick it up as a teaching tool um, because a lot of the other books that have been written are been around for a long time and every Holocaust survivor who has articulated enough to tell their story has something unique to say. And with that, I think we'll open up to questions. Um, can you uh, let everyone know how they can get the book if they don't already have so all the proceeds from this book are going to the Ann Jaffe Tolerance and Holocaust Education Fund. It is a part of the Jewish Federation of Delaware. For that reason, we encourage people to buy it by the printer because we make a lot more money on it that way. So lulu.com, if you have the book and you open it up on the copyright page, you'll see lulu.com. And it also has a bookstore there. And you can click on the bookstore and then search my mother's name or the name of the book. And when you do that, the fund makes something like uh, $10 a book, which will buy more books for kids in schools. If you don't have the patience or are able to do it that way, it is also available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. There we get far less, but you still get your book and you can read it. Um, also, this also, one more thing, locally, if you are local and you want it, we have a box of books, which we will happily sell, you know, individual copies. A lot of people have come. And then of course they want mom's autograph in the book um, and you won't have to pay for shipping. So um, if you're anywhere in the greater Wilmington area and you want to get some books, you can be in touch with us. I'm sorry, Carrie, what was your question? Uh, that's okay. It, this isn't a question. I just wanted to let you know that on Friday, Margaret Crouch did a um, workshop in Dover for 41 teachers. And your book was given out, Anne's book was given out to all the teachers. So oh, that's 21 great. teachers. Yeah, it was a really, Hope really good workshop. Hopefully they'll find it valuable and maybe they'll want to suggest it to their students to read. Great. Any other questions for my mom or me? Well, since, uh, since no one else has asked, I think the uh, overriding question at the moment is uh, how how you're affected by what's uh, going on uh, in Israel right now. Mm -hmm. Is that question for me or for mom? Uh, uh, it was... For either either or both. Well, if you read the book, you might remember that I actually lived in Israel for a while. Who is it? Um, and so I lived there for nine years. I'm a Hebrew speaker. And um, 
I actually lived through the Gulf War. So when I heard about this, I, I was starting to have flashbacks of um, that, that very difficult time. Um, at that time, the big worry was uh, chemical warfare, um, which I really haven't heard much about here because it's kind of um, a ground operation. But um, yes, I mean, I think it's very um, heartening that Jews everywhere, I now live in the greater Philadelphia area myself, and there was a rally at the Kaiserman JCC mm -hmm. where I went, and it was a huge show of support and people. And um, I think predominantly they were Jewish people, but I also put on my Facebook page, I don't know if any of you saw it, um, Eric Adams gave the mayor of New York, of, of uh, Manhattan, gave a speech that was so awesome. And he said, you know, the Jews backed us up and we are with you guys. This is our problem. And he mentioned that the swastikas that were used at the Palestinian um, protest was an outrage. And um, it's really worth watching because it was just, it really made me feel like we're not in this on our own. And that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for the American public at large and other countries to coalesce and understand, even though the news today, if you watch it 24 seven, they show so much Palestinian mm -hmm. suffering, but you don't see it equally on the Israeli side. They talk about numbers. They, they show bunkers with blood, but I feel like it is, um, painting a sympathetic picture, of course, for the Palestinians. And I feel for the Palestinians. Um, there are so many of them that did not have a hand in this, but what they did have a hand in was electing Hamas as their leaders and then letting them do it. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm looking for general support for Israel and their right to defend, and not only defend, but make sure that Hamas cannot do this again. Right. Mom, do you want to say anything about it? I think I mentioned how I feel about it. I uh, cannot leave the television, you know, for a while. Uh, I want to hear every step by step what happened and who is supporting us and who is ridiculing us or denying the fact that we did not do it just to destroy Hamas, but to stop them from destroying their own people and ours. So I am very much interested in how the world will respond to it. Uh, um, uh, Margaret Crouch's name came up. She is, uh, of course, uh, a Holocaust educator and a longtime member of the committee in Delaware. She text, she uh, emailed me. I was looking forward to attending your Zoom today with Ann and Linda. My granddaughter is on her way to Christiana Hospital in labor, getting oh, ready dear. to deliver my my third great grandchild. Uh -huh. I, I would like to be with her, but have no idea when the baby will make his or her entrance. <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I, I want to uh, 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 recognize uh, Simone Gorko, who has her hand up. Simone is a longtime uh, former uh, president of Sons and Daughters of Holocaust Survivors and a long time friend. Thank you. Um, and thank you for sharing your story. I know it's a hard time to be speaking. Um, many of us who are second generation are glad that our parents aren't watching this. So um, 
I want to send you strength to watch it. And um, Linda, you look just like your mother. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the two of your, and thank you for telling her story. Um, as a psychologist, I want to say that we shouldn't all be watching all of this all the time. Yeah, it, It's too much. Um, it's in our heads already and it just mm -hmm. makes it horrible. So um, just take some breaks from it. Um, you're not going to miss much. The 24 hour news stuff is just, they're showing the same things over and over. So just take care of yourselves, um, reach out to others, enjoy nature, eat, drink, um, love one another, and, and don't just focus on the horror. Yeah. Thank you, Simone. I see, uh, I, I would like to give our dear friend, sister Jean Cashman an opportunity to to speak if you'd like to. Yes, I, I was trying to get your attention earlier. Um, I just wanted to say to Anne and Linda about the book that, you know, I have known Anne through the Holocaust Education Committee for and Linda for many years. And um so glad to see you in, in person since I haven't been there for a while. But um I want to say that I, I was aware of the kind of the outline of Anne's story. And um, because, you know, even at meetings and with us, she rarely spoke about, you know, um, her experiences. But for me, one of the most powerful parts of the book are the, the last chapters where she talks about what happened here and how she took this whole awful experience behind her and built a beautiful family here. I'm going to cry. <laughs> but I was just so touched by the resilience and um, and love and in that you can go on and love and give advice to be kind to people after what you've experienced. Uh, that For me, that's the most amazing thing. And I thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I miss being at the meetings, as you know, I'm not only 92 years old, but I just fell and have an injured arm. So oh. I'm I'm hoping to recover from it, but who you knows? will. He will. <laughs> sure he will. So the two, the two, uh, the thing that brought me to Israel were um, my mother had two brothers living in Israel, her oldest, Mayer, and the youngest, Sheldon. Sadly, they're both deceased now, but they were my surrogate family when I lived there for so many years. Um, and we have first cousins living there, and they both have... <laughs> Uh, Sister Jean, talk about the next generation. I think that the survivors, especially the survivors, they as as a as a a gesture of defiance, wanted to have children and grandchildren, and um, and you know we were lucky because our parents raised us, you know, in a in a nice environment. But uh, both my both my first cousins in Israel have lots of children, and their children have lots of children, and so we have a very big extended family. In addition to my father's side of the family, where there are quite a few people in Israel as well, so we definitely have a, a very um, not just sympathetic. You know, they're they're our people. You know, we 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 are um, of the same tribe and feel very close to them. Any other um, questions? Well, this isn't really a question, but one of the uh, uh, photographs that uh, that I found recently and put out uh, to promote today's program was uh, a photo from 1981 when we had a tree planting ceremony in front of the 
Jewish Community Center in Wilmington, um, in which uh, Ann Jaffe is shown speaking into a microphone being held by Judith Fogel, who uh, at the time was uh, uh, a reporter for WILM in Wilmington mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. who is uh, with us today. So uh, I, I think you're coming to us today from Baltimore or Washington? Actually, I live in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm in Alexandria, Virginia. David, I saw that photograph. I wanted to comment on it, but then I decided I'd come on the program. That really took me back. And yes, that was 1981. I was working as a reporter for WILM, and I had met David's parents. I did a documentary on the Holocaust. I was working for a radio station in Wilmington, Delaware, and I was featuring Delaware Holocaust survivors. And that's where I met David's parents, Helena and George Preston, and where I met David. And that that's amazing, David, that you have that photograph. I meant to 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 respond a little more in depth. That's that that was that really took me back. That was very gratifying to see that. I remembered that event perfectly. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you uh just recently had a, a family uh, tragedy. So I don't uh, that, uh, yes. blame you for, don't blame you for not uh, responding. Yes, thank you. I see a picture of Joey. Is this Joey Schmidt? Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is, hello. But, you look very good, Joey. Okay, thank you. It's an older picture. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I like to use it for Zoom. It's just very... Uh, anyway, uh, oh yes, we're, we're, all, all of my family are very uh, proud of you for writing this book. And um, I started reading it and then my sister borrowed it and she hasn't given it back yet. And she's, <laughs> she loved it. Uh, she said she was going to try to be on the... Uh, Zoom, but she might have, I think she had something else that was on the schedule. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, the story of our of your family and, and our family, I mean, we should have a book too. I mean, on the Jaffe's and the Schmidt's and uh, how we how, how they survived in Siberia and, and um, then wandered around Europe until we were finally able to come to America. Um, this amazing, it's just amazing. I'm really proud of you, uh, Cousin Anne, because uh, you're doing you're doing such wonderful things, and um, I know I've come I've come to a couple of events that you've had of honoring you, and uh, it's it's just amazing. You know, just keep up the good work as long as you can. It's just fantastic. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. Regards to the family. I will. I will. Tell, I will try to get them to watch uh, the the uh, recording. If we can. Okay. Thank you. So if there are no more questions. Can I also uh, ask you, Anne, um, in the book, um, you have a number of photographs. Um, and of course, the, the more recent ones, we know where they came from. But where did you um, find the older photographs? I'm always curious because I go through photographs from my family and um, you know, we have actually, I have a lot of them from my father because he had an aunt that um, after they were taken, she was able to go into their home and take things. And so I have photographs of my father's side. I don't have very many of my mother's, uh, in fact, very, very few of my mother as a young child. And it looks like you have a number of them that you put in the book. And I was curious where you re where you found them, where, where you were able to get them. Of course, after the war, we had none. But when we came to the United States and we were lucky, my father had a brother here from before the war. And so did my mother. And these are pictures we found uh, with them because we send it to them before the war started, and that's how we, you know, acquired them. That's a good question. A lot Great, of people ask you. that, and um, yeah, because they had nothing. They lost everything. But right. just like when I had kids and I was far away, I sent pictures of my kids to mom, so she had them, and 
her uncles had these pictures, which were later shared with them. That was great. Um, uh, Linda, do, do, I want to give you an opportunity, if you'd like to, uh, to read a, a passage from the book that you that you uh, uh, think is particularly uh, significant. Oh, you know, I didn't, all... I didn't mark it, but but the but the one that um, most people like. I'm sorry, I didn't mark it. Um, That's okay. Is when um, and maybe you have it marked. If you told me what the page is, I could read it. Um, okay. is uh, when my mother was outraged. They were mourning a year out and she was saying Yisker for her one brother that did not make it. Mm -hmm. And she became overwhelmed with emotion mm -hmm. and was already old enough to feel free to say how she hated the world, the free world that let this happen to them. Mm -hmm. And her father took her aside and said, I need to, I need to sit down and talk to you. And he asks her, I heard you say that you hate somebody, you hate people. Did you like it when they hated us? And she said, of course not. Then, then why would you do to others that was hateful to us? And um, and so um, this this is really a pivotal moment in her life because um, her father, who she adored, and unfortunately I never met because he died before we were born, um, tried to reason with her that hate will only eat you up from inside. The people you hate don't know that you hate them. It doesn't matter to them, but you hating will destroy you. And so that, um, that's on page 136, if you want to read it. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Oh. All righty. Um, let me start one earlier. We did not want to think about the war years. We did, however, start observing a day of remembrance when our Jewish neighbors of Kabilnik were murdered by local militia and Nazi soldiers. We knew it was the day after Yom Kippur. I was about 15 or 16 years old, and I was overcome with emotions when I said a prayer for my brother who was murdered by the Nazis. It was numbing to remember that night and our escape. Heart-wrenching to think of our dear friends murdered for no reason other than their religion. I found myself crying hysterically, expressing out loud my outrage against anyone around, uh, asking anyone, everyone around me, where was the free world? Why didn't they try to stop it? I hate all of them. I was still so young and naive. I didn't even understand what the free world meant, but I had heard it referenced many times. My father heard my outburst and became concerned about my feelings of anger and hatred and asked me to sit down and talk with him. He started the conversation with a question to me. We were victims of hatred. Did you like it? Of course not then why would you do to others that which is hateful to you? The people that you hate don't know it and don't care. Your hatred will only destroy you. Try another attitude. Show kindness and caring to others, especially those who are less fortunate than you. You will be an example to others. Love and kindness can spread just as fast as hate. That's uh, just beautiful. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask uh, a question that probably is in many people's minds uh, when they 
read or hear uh, from a survivor, um, especially a survivor who was brought up in a in a religiously observant home, and as you describe it so beautifully in your book, uh, a, a, a loving uh, and uh, um, beautiful upbringing. Um, aside from the uh, initial uh, impulse to hate everyone, which I think we, we, we all could understand. Um, did you, what did this experience do to your uh, uh, level of uh, religious uh, belief, your faith? That's a good question. Mom? Yes. Well, I, while we were still with my parents, there was absolutely no question about it. it. My mother especially never lost her faith in God. No matter what happened, I remember her saying, when we said, where is God? Where is God? She would say, he's in heaven crying for us. He cannot affect things. People can affect what other people are doing. But once we went on our own, uh, got married and had children, we tried to introduce Judaism in general to our children, but not specifically push religion upon them. Like we decided that let them do the choosing by themselves. And because as a result of letting them choose by themselves, I must say with pride, one of my granddaughters has chosen to become a religious person. She is now a Shomer Shabbos and is raising children as religious Jews. So we can never tell where we will find religion. I personally have never given up Jewish tradition because it is part of my life. Yeah, Thank I'm you. getting I, I think. I'm uh, getting, sorry. I'm, get, I'm getting a little tired. So, unless there are other questions, I will move on. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. Um, I want to uh, point out again, even though he's been silent throughout this, uh, uh, Christopher Simpson has been on this call. Uh, he's an absolutely. Uh, extraordinary investigative reporter and we will have we will be spotlighting his book blowback on december 3rd and uh, he lives in maryland now and uh, i hope that everyone will find the time to uh, to join us uh, for that program thank you for for being with us chris thanks to aunt jaffe and linda jaffe thanks to judy fogel and thanks to all of our friends and sister Jean Cashman, who lives now where? Uh, remind us. Uh, anyway, she, sister she Jean Cashman. Okay, well, uh, she's no longer living in the area, but she's she's a, a, a participant on Zoom. So, thanks everybody. And thanks to my dear friend, Ann Jaffe. And uh, we will uh, uh, put this recording out for the public and uh, hope to sell some copies of this uh, extraordinary book. And Lulu uh, I'll see everybody. Lulu.com. Lulu we hope for uh, peace in Israel. Amen. And uh, I'll see everybody farther down the road. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, David. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Linda.